primarily known for all of her tractors. For the, when you're a farm kid in Vermont, you grow up with something that works. And uh, brothers and I would fight hammer and tong to drive the Olivers we had on the farm. Get up early, beat them out any way we could. And it's become quite an affection and quite an affliction. The joke in the household is we have plenty of Olivers, uh, but just never seems to be enough. There was just something magic about the way they operated. The fact that they were the first to have six cylinders and very smooth, almost car-like drive. Plenty of power, um, very maneuverable, and uh, just captured the imagination. Their philosophy was to make something that was intelligent, uh, stylish, functional and ever ever able to be modified to do whatever agricultural job was necessary and um, they did a fabulous job of making high horsepower um, good handling and very efficient machinery uh, this is a 1957 oliver super 99 uh, it has a general motors 371 diesel engine in it at the time it was the most the, the tractor with the most horsepower and um, the most gears in that period of time. Um, it was very powerful, it's quite noisy, uh, but it has high, very high collector value, and um, I could sell it in a heartbeat um, <laughs> if I was so inclined. It's not for sale. I started collecting Chinese fine art because of a job. My job sent me unexpectedly to China in 1980. But during this time, I asked all the stupid questions of the experts about Chinese art, and they were generous with their knowledge. So I learned a good deal about Chinese art and fell in love with it. So over the years, because I knew the artists, knew the sources, knew the dealers in China, I was able to find art that I just fell in love with. My favorite genre are the landscapes. The Chinese art to me is a metaphysical experience. It's so full of imagination. I walk into the paintings and travel where they take me. This, this is an album leaf, which is common. They, they did accordion-shaped books with usually 8, 12, or 16 paintings in them. And when the pages came apart, they became separate paintings. This never was a fan, never was intended to be a fan. The fan shape was considered beautiful, and so this artist in mid-1800s painted a landscape in the fan shape for his book. And there's a tiny little scholar on a tiny little path heading up to a tiny little house up there in the middle of the mountains, which is, again, the Taoist concept of man is very small and nature is huge. I love that painting. I had a lot of problem with when I started wanting to collect these things. I kept saying to myself, what are you doing? You don't have room for this. You can't afford to do this. What are you doing? And I finally decided that if this was my passion, I could find a way to afford it. And so I, I, I've done it. collect, uh, and I still have them, Demitas coffee cups, It was which were used for drinking very strong coffee after dinner. I think I got started collecting them. My aunt and uncle that I was very close to um, brought back a little one from Ireland. So I said, oh, that's lovely. I think I'd like to get some more. So then my husband, um, each time he would go away, he'd go to a different city in the United States and he'd find a museum or he'd find a place and he'd buy one for me. Well, I collect a lot of things. What you're in today is one of um, the uh, divisions of the Wascomium, which is a contemporary visual art collection. I'm very um, intoxicated with the idea of materials that are not traditionally used in art being used in art. Um, I like um, comments on current cultural mores. Um, there are certain subject uh, categories that I seem to gravitate towards. Um, chairs, uh, shopping carts, rifles and guns, um, flamingos, invertebrate images. Um, but then there's a lot of abstract work that really doesn't um, uh, reference anything in the real world at all. There's a fellow who passed away recently named David Huber, who was an incredible assemblage artist. And um, I went to the South End Art Hop in 1998. It uh, switch flipped, it hasn't flipped back. 
um, and um, I was very intoxicated and entranced with this piece. It was almost like a religious experience, and I remember thinking, oh, it's really wonderful, it's so big, and I probably can't afford it, and where would I put it, and all of the things that probably people are either thinking about consciously or subconsciously when they don't buy art. And, and which is most people and went to his studio and ended up purchasing five pieces of which that was one and making room <laughs> and, um, and it's just kind of gone on since then um, so yeah it's just it, it, uh, six months or so after that incident I had between three and five hundred pieces and I realized that I was in the game as they say and so I realized that I must be doing this and I had to make room in my life for it and it's really become the defining thing that I do in life. I have a complete collection of Morgan Silver Dollars. I got started as a child. My mother used to have an apartment house and we had a tenant upstairs who used to pay his rent in Silver Dollars. Then I would get some for my birthday or Christmas or something, and I've been collecting ever since. I just saw some old fans. Uh, I started with retro fans, and I just thought they were really cool, and every company had their own sort of design, and, and each was different. And uh, then I got into the antique fans, and they're, I think they're just really interesting and beautiful. They can just sit there and be beautiful or they can serve a purpose and I can use them. And uh, they're beautiful when they're running too. And you know, the, the cages, as you can see, they, they look like they're moving almost uh, just with those designs. But I think they're just beautiful examples of uh, great industrial design. In the 50s and 60s, they started, you can see them start to go a little bit cheaper um, and with the materials that they started to use. This has aluminum blades, um, cast aluminum base, the steel housing. Uh, it's all one, one piece of metal, but the earlier ones, this, this one has steel blades, uh, but these two have micarta blades, which are a really early laminate material developed by Westinghouse. And it made for really lightweight, quiet fan blades. Because a lot of antique fans, you'll see that, that they have brass blades. Uh, and if we turn this on and you listen to it, it's louder than the micarta ones. So it was a real development. Think about it, and you know, 90 years later, these still work fine. You can run them all day. Um, they don't, they don't make things like they used to. Yeah, that's my collection. And uh, I collect uh, postcards from different places in the world because I'm really interested in uh, cities and sites of different countries and so I have great pleasure in looking at the postcard. I collect license plates. Um, I got started collecting when I was in grade school. My father was a farmer and rented a farm and there was an old Vermont plate laying out beside the barn and it was just really rusty and just about falling apart. But one day he walked by and said, gee, you don't see many of those around anymore so you ought to pick that up and save it which I did, and well, of course, once you pick one up, then you look around to see if you can find others, and several thousand later, here I am. <laughs> there are, overall, so many license plates, no one person could ever collect everything there is, and so you do have to kind of specialize, and so I have collected mainly Vermont plates in all of the non-passenger varieties. By this, I mean truck, trailer, motorcycle, dealer, and all of the various other sorts that a lot of people probably never have heard of, things like poultry dealer. <laughs> Vermont passed a law that you had to have your car registered by May 1st, 1905, and this is the plate that you got. These plates were made by taking a sheet of iron and covering with porcelain enamel, sort of like a kitchen pot would be today. The uh, next plate is a 1924 
Vermont truck plate. That would be what the truck that's now up on the uh, Ticonderoga would have had on it when it was brand new. And the last plate is a regular 1939 Vermont passenger plate, except being number one, that was used by George Aiken, who was governor of Vermont at the time and later went on to be a U.S. Senator from Vermont for many, many years. I never met a plate I couldn't take. <laughs>